A Guide to Growing Shallots A member of the onion family, shallots are typically milder in flavor. Originating from Asia, shallots are now enjoyed around the world and can be added to any dish that onions would be. They're also a good source of nutrients, vitamins, and minerals. Shallot Varieties French Varieties these are the commercial shallots that are available in local grocery stores, with French red being the most common. They all have brownish red skin, pinkish purplish flesh, and pear-shaped bulbs. Their flavor is a subtle combination of onion and garlic. Grey Grisel Considered to be the best in terms of flavor, their pear-shaped bulbs have grey skin and pinkish white flesh. Dutch This variety has a stronger flavor, more like that of an onion than other shallot varieties. They tend to be round with orange-yellow skin and yellowish cream-colored flesh. Saffron A hybrid shallot with bright coppery skin and pale yellow flesh, which can be stored for six months or more. Ambition A large French cultivar that also stores well. Conserver A slightly longer variety with a reddish-brown outside and pale pink inside. Camelot an attractive variety that's dark red on the outside and white on the inside. Starting from seeds. Direct seeding. Sow shallots in a two inch, five centimeter wide band, about two seeds per inch and a quarter to a half inch deep, one to 1.5 centimeters, in rows that are spaced about 12 to 18 inches, 30 to 45 centimeters apart. Plants should be thinned to 2 inches, 5 centimeters apart, to get high yields in fertile soil. Or plants can be thinned to 3 to 4 inches, 7 to 10 centimeters apart for larger shallots. Shallots that are grown from seed are responsive to day length, so they need to be planted early enough in the spring to respond to the lengthening days of summer to form their bulbs. Transplanting Plant seedlings six to eight weeks before they're set to be transplanted outside, sowing three seeds in each cell of a 72-cell tray. Seeds will emerge in about six to 12 days, depending on their soil temperature. They prefer when it's 50 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 16 to 25 degrees Celsius, and they don't need light to germinate. Allow seedlings 60 days in the nursery stage, then they can be transplanted as a clump, spacing each one about 6 inches, 15 centimeters apart. When starting shallots indoors, seedlings can be trimmed with scissors once they are about 6 inches, 15 centimeters tall, which will help prevent them from falling over. Starting from cloves or sets. First, separate the sections, cloves. Then plant individual cloves about 1 to 1.5 inches, 2.5 to 3 centimeters deep, and spaced about 3 to 4 inches, 7 to 10 centimeters apart. Press them in the ground so that the pointed bulb tip is pointed up and either just below the soil line or barely sticking out of the soil. Finally, allow about 12 to 24 inches, 30 to 60 centimeters between rows. Transplants can typically be moved to the garden after 30 to 60 days, but avoid planting the bulbs or plants deeply and do not move any soil to cover their base. That's because bulbs should grow out of the ground to make them easier to divide. Also, get rid of the weak clumps as well as the smallest plants. Bulbs can be planted at a depth of one to two inches, 2.5 to five centimeters deep, while spaced about six to eight inches, 15 to 20 centimeters apart. Then, plants should be mulched lightly with leaves or straw to slow the growth of weeds and to maintain a consistent moisture level in the soil. The roots of the plants will be very shallow, so it's important to be extremely careful when cultivating or weeding to avoid damaging the shallots. Shallots should be planted in a spot that gets full sun, in well-drained soil that's either been amended or top-dressed with some compost. The general rule of thumb is that the looser the soil composition, the larger the shallots will grow. Then, as the plants continue to grow, soil can be mounded up around their base. Before planting, it's important to make sure that the garden area isn't one where garlic bulbs have previously grown. 
When it comes to their soil, shallots will thrive in ones that have a pH level between 6.0 and 6.8. As well, shallots have shallow root systems, so they need consistent moisture and good weed control. Weeds compete with shallots for moisture, light, and nutrients, so it's definitely important to keep weeds under control. It's also beneficial to bend or lodge the stalks when they are at least 16 inches tall, which will force the shallots to mature in three to four weeks. Then thin seedlings to three to four inches, seven to 10 centimeters apart or wider, depending on the variety that's being grown. As shallots grow, head up some additional soil onto them. Fertilizer. Aged compost can be added to the garden beds before planting and shallots can be side-dressed with aged compost around mid-season. Glacial rock dust is also a useful soil amendment for the shallot bed because it provides a wide range of minerals necessary for the good growth of shallot plants. Otherwise, either a half or a full cup of complete organic fertilizer can be applied beneath every 10 feet, three meters of row. Mulching. Since shallots are planted close to the surface, a bed of peat, compost, or well-rotted manure will help the shallots to retain moisture. This is essential when the plants are young because they can easily dry out. For fall planting, where winters are cold, a six-inch blanket of leaves will protect shallot plants. <laughs> Don't worry about burying them. The shallots will grow right through the leaves in the spring. Also, mulch helps to reduce soil heaving while protecting the plants. Shallots actually grow best when they're started from bulbs or cloves, which can be done indoors. Then, after about 30 to 45 days, they're ready for transplant. Before transplanting, harden off shallot seedlings for about two weeks by gradually exposing them to cooler temperatures and direct sunlight. Beets, lettuce, strawberries, celery, leeks, and tomatoes are all great companions for shallots. Avoid planting shallots with beans or peas. Raised beds. Choose a weed-free and well-drained location. Then prepare the bed by turning the soil under to a depth of eight inches. Level with a rake to remove clumps of grass and stones. Then incorporate generous amounts of quality compost and a slow-release fertilizer before planting. Cell trays. Sow three seeds into individual containers, thinning to two plants per cell after the plants germinate. These cell trays allow for better root development, which will make the shallot stronger. Bulb mites. Pests that stunt a plant's growth, reduces crop yields, and causes bulbs to rot either in the ground or in storage. The damage caused by bulb mites can also create an entrance point for other pests and diseases. Here's what to do. Avoid planting successive crops of onions or garlic in the same spot. It might also help to fallow the field, giving it a break by not planting in it for a period of time, which will ensure that any organic residue decomposes completely. Crop residues can harbor mite populations, so make sure any residue is completely gone. As well, treating seeds or cloves with hot water before planting them might also help reduce bulb mite infestations. Onion flies and onion maggots. They begin as larvae, maggots, in the soil over the winter. Then they will emerge as flies in the spring. Females typically lay their eggs at the base of a plant's stem and cool, moist conditions will increase their chance of survival. The larvae will feed on the roots and stems of a plant, and the damage they cause can act as an entry point for soft rot bacteria. As well, this damage can stunt the growth of seedlings or make them wilt. If you try to pull up affected plants, often the plants will break at the soil line. Also, if an infestation happens while plants are forming bulbs, those bulbs will then be deformed and susceptible to storage rots after harvest. Here's what to do. 
Good sanitation is important. And all crop residue should be removed at the end of the season, since maggots will die without a food source. It's also important to remove any volunteer, wild onion and chive plants, as these can act as an infection source. Finally, floating row covers might provide some protection by preventing females from laying eggs around the crops. If there are noticeable symptoms from these pests, pull out all the plants and use what greens are salvageable. Then destroy the rest of the plant parts since the flies that produce onion maggots can continue to lay eggs, causing problems for future crops. As well, it's important to practice crop rotation. One last option is to place yellow sticky cards around plants to attract and trap the adult onion flies. Onion thrips. Insects that leave white specks on the leaves of a plant. Its larvae burrow into the underground stems and can cause young plants to turn yellow and wilt. Here's what to do. Remove any yellow plants immediately and practice good crop rotation. Insecticidal soaps can also be applied to deal with onion thrips. Botrytis leaf blight. At first, this disease causes small oval white spots to grow on the leaves. These lesions are often surrounded by a halo of green water-soaked tissue, and the lesion centers eventually turn tan in color and then collapse. If there are too many lesions on a single leaf, the entire plant top can die back, giving severely affected fields a blasted appearance. Here's what to do. The destruction of call piles and rotating crops for at least two to three years are two important ways to help lower the risk of disease outbreaks. Because these cultural practices are only partially effective and no resistant varieties are available, protective fungicides might also have to be repeatedly applied to crops. Neck rot. Infected scales will become soft, brownish, and spongy. Gray mold will form either between the scales or more commonly at the neck area, which becomes sunken. As a result, the entire bulb can dry out. Here's what to do. The most common way this disease happens is through the exposed areas when plants are topped before they have completely dried. To help reduce losing too many crops, plant varieties that mature properly so that neck tissues are dry before storage. Generally, colored varieties are more resistant than white varieties. Also, as harvest time approaches, stop watering plants to allow the plant's tops to dry. Allow the tops to fully mature before harvest, and then be sure not to store any improperly cured bulbs. Onion downy mildew. A fungal disease that damages both the leaves and bulbs of a plant, resulting in poor crop yields. Onion powdery mildew is mostly a problem in damp conditions. Here's what to do. Plant resistant varieties whenever possible and make sure to prune and remove any weeds to improve air circulation. As well, water onions in the early morning hours or use a soaker hose to give the onions lots of time to dry out. Make sure to also keep the ground under infected plants clean during the fall and winter to prevent the disease from spreading and remove and destroy any plants that have a serious infection. As well, this disease is somewhat easy to control on most plants when they're protected by a copper spray. Copper treatments can begin about two weeks before the disease normally appears and when weather forecasts predict a long period of wet weather. Or copper treatments can start when the disease first appears and then treatments can be repeated at seven to 10 day intervals for as long as needed. Finally, there are also some leaf sprays that can be helpful. Onion smut. A disease causing dark brown streaks that run up and down the leaves, which initially look like long blisters on the leaf surface. As these lesions mature, they turn brown and contain a mass of dark powdery spores 
that give the plant tops a sooty appearance. Diseased leaves might bend or twist abnormally, and those leaves are usually dropped prematurely. This fungus will stunt the overall growth of affected plants. Onion smut typically thrives in temperatures under 75 degrees Fahrenheit, and the fungus can live in the soil for several years. Here's what to do. Rotate crops and avoid planting in the same spot for at least three years. Also, encourage rapid growth of the plants with watering and fertilizer in order to get these plants safely past their vulnerable stage. Also, seeds can be treated with certain fungicides before sowing, while the seed bed can be treated with methyl bromide, a type of harmless gas. If onion smut is found on any plants, certain fungicides can be used to fight against it. Onion white rot. A soil-borne fungus that can cause the yellowing and wilting of leaves above ground, while rotting the roots and invading the bulb beneath the soil. A white fluffy fungus will also appear at the base of the bulb, and later that white fungus becomes covered in small, round black growths. Here's what to do. Follow a three to four year rotation with allium crops, onions, garlic, chives, to help prevent onion white rot. Also, it's important to properly sanitize any onion debris, especially called onions. Incorporate all onion debris into the soil immediately after harvest. No exposed culls should be present in the soil before the next round of crops are planted. It also helps to plant only high quality seeds while carefully inspecting transplants for signs of contamination. As well, avoid extra or late applications of nitrogen. Instead, it's best to use split nitrogen applications. Make sure to also manage any weeds, since that will improve air movement around the crops while allowing the tops to dry off faster. Pink Root Rot A fungus that attacks the roots of a plant, causing those roots to turn from light pink to red and eventually purple-brown. Pink root rot also causes roots to shrivel and stunts the plant's growth because eventually those affected roots will die back. Infected plants will show signs of nutrient deficiencies and drought since their roots can't take up water or nutrients. Typically, this disease lives in the soil for several years and thrives in warm temperatures that are above 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius. Pink root rot is usually caused by soil that's been heavily wet for more than two weeks. Here's what to do. Plant disease-resistant varieties if they're available, and try to plant as early as possible so that the bulk of the plant's growth will be in cooler temperatures. As well, long crop rotations of three to six years with non-susceptible crops will help reduce this pink root rot disease but it won't get rid of it entirely. Drip watering is a good way to control plants' moisture level while also avoiding pink rot in the process. As well, plowing and mulching the soil promotes air circulation to fight against this fungus. Finally, soil solarization can also be helpful. Simply cover the ground with a tarp in hot weather so that it traps the heat from the sun in order to kill off the disease. If pink root rot is found in the garden, be sure to remove any and all infected plants. Purple Blotch Symptoms of this disease first appear as small tan spots on the leaves. Those lesions, which are usually surrounded by a ring of purple, eventually become sunken and will quickly expand up and down the leaf. If there are too many leaf lesions, they can cause the collapse of the entire top of the plant Purple blotch favors warm and humid conditions, and it typically begins on the older leaves of a plant. The bulbs can also get infected by stem wounds. Here's what to do. Plant disease-free seeds in appropriate spacing to avoid excessive leaf wetness and to improve air circulation. As well, practice crop rotation and harvest in dry weather. Good drainage is also important and it helps to avoid using excess doses of nitrogen fertilizers and to use fungicides frequently.
finally, avoid crop injuries and practice good field sanitation, like cleaning garden tools after working in a specific spot in the garden. Harvesting. Shallots can be harvested once their leaves have begun to turn brown and fall over. Typically, this takes about 90 to 120 days from planting, and each clove should yield 10 or more shallots. Simply dig the bulbs gently, loosening their surrounding soil with a spading fork. Then wipe off any dirt. Next, place the shallots on trays or a wire rack in a shady, dry, and well-ventilated place. The shallots should be cured this way for at least three weeks. Storage. Shallots store well in temperatures of 32 to 35 degrees Fahrenheit, zero to two degrees Celsius, with 60 to 70% relative humidity. Because of their small size, shallots tend to pack closely, so they shouldn't be placed in deep piles. Also, shallots can be stored in slated crates or trays, which allow for good air movement in and around the bulbs. This is an important step to remove any excessive moisture and to minimize storage diseases. Dry the shallots in a place that's away from apples and tomatoes. They give off ethylene gas, which causes shallot bulbs to sprout. With good airflow and humidity control, shallots should keep in storage for about eight to 10 months.